We're now continuing the story of Helen of the Glen, that is the Tales of the Covenanters by Robert Pollock. And yesterday we finished just at a point before the news comes to Mrs. Thompson. And let me continue that. Now it may be that you've only tuned in and you'll find this language a little bit archaic, but I want to be faithful and true to the book when it was written and in the content of that book. And so we read... The letter which brought the painful account informed her that her husband died a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He was heard on the bloody field of battle, recommending with his last breath his widowed wife and fatherless children to the God of the widow and fatherless, and God will hear this sincere request, said the mother as she wiped her tears, and through a gleam of celestial hope and patient resignation on her weeping children. God is the widow's stay. He's the father of the fatherless, and he doesn't forsake anyone who puts their trust in him. Meanwhile, the rage and the cruelty of persecution became all the more uh, inveterate day by day. Cleverhouse, whose merciless sword widowed many a tender mother and orphaned many a helpless infant, was about this time time routed at Luden Hill, by a party of the Covenanters whose sufferings had driven them to arms. Because of this event, it stung the heart of the proud and the bold and cruel Claverhouse, and so he now spared no exertions to pursue, torture and kill those who would not renounce service to God in heaven. Sometime before this military trial was instituted in Scotland, And all who refused it, this thing called the wicked test, where they were forced to recant their faith, but, and if not, they were instantly shot. The brutal dragoons plundered, tortured, murdered, and committed every species of outrage at pleasure, so that at no hour and in no place, whether in the house, the glen, or the cave, or the mountain, were Christian people of the great shepherds safe from the persevering search and the unrelenting cruelty of their persecutors. And so it was in the western districts of Scotland when on a fine Sunday morning, a little after midsummer, Mrs. Thompson was early up and preparing as usual to hear the word of God which was to be preached that day two miles down the glen at the head of which the widow's hut stood. The preacher that day was a faithful ambassador of Jesus. He was already there, and his little congregation mostly gathered around him. The place chosen for this day's worship was hidden from the distant view by the sides of the glen, one of which, withdrawing five or six yards from the streamlet, left a small green plain in the shape of a crescent, and there, on a large grey stone, he rested his Bible. On a little knoll, a small distance, watched one of their friends, so as to give alarm in case the appearance of the persecuting soldiers. The minister, to whose church Mrs. Thompson in her earlier days often walked with her father and mother, had been driven from his flock and his family by violence, and now, concealed by the peasants who loved him, was fed by their kindness and took every opportunity in cave or mur to distribute among the poor and hunted followers of Christ the gospel. This man now threw a glance of fatherly compassion on his little flock and lifted up the Bible from the grey stone, opened and read some verses that described the Jews' captivity at Babylon. By Babylon's stream we sat and wept. When Zion we thought on, in the midst thereof we hanged our harps the willow trees upon. For there a song required they who did us captive bring. Our spoilers called for mirth and said, A song of Zion sing. But how the Lord's song shall we sing within a foreign land? Thee, Jerusalem, I forget, skill part from my right hand. The psalm being ended, all rose and he turned to pray. He opened his Bible and he read a text saying, from Proverbs 9 and 10, The fear of man brings a snare, but the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And that sermon continued. And at the end of that sermon, the minister offered up his heart's desire to God when 
The watchman gave the alarm that the party of cavalry was, cavalry was approaching. The minister looked to the heavens, cried, Into your hands, O Lord, we commit our spirits. And then the congregation dispersed quickly. The good old servant of God, he begged them to leave him, knowing that a price had been set on his head. The pursuit after him would be more eager. It happened as he thought. The reverent pastor was taken, put on horseback, his hands tied behind his back, and his ankles twisted with ropes below the animal. In this position, without refreshment, without being permitted once to alight, he was driven to Edinburgh, a distance of 50 miles, where after much torture, he was executed at the grass market, praising God, solacing his friends, and forgiving his murderers. Mrs. Thompson and her daughter had fled up the glen and were now within a mile of their hut when two of the troopers discovered them. As they approached with their prancing steeds and gleaming armour, uttering strange oaths, Helen turned pale and seized her mother's hand. The soldiers appeared rather intoxicated and their whole aspect was fierce and cruel. One of them, Duncan Rathburn, a North countryman, full of the merciless spirit of his master, Cleverhouse commanded Mrs. Thompson to take the test or the shot that was in his carabine. She kneeled before them. She pleaded with them not to force her to violate her conscience and to renounce her allegiance to her king of kings. None of your cantings, brawled Rathburn, and with a horrible oath commanded her again to take the test to abjure conventicles or else he would blow out her brains on the spot. I will not she says. But, oh, spare a poor widow. Spare me for the sake of my husband who died fighting for his king. Spare me for the sake of that child and her little brother. Spare me as you expect mercy at the judgment on the great day. The good widow, having refused again to violate her conscience and dishonor her Redeemer by submitting to their demands, it was vain to entreat them. She looked with a streaming eye on her daughter. They will kill your mother, she said. You shall be left orphans. You shall be left helpless or orphans in the world, but God will be your father. Never forsake him, and he will never forsake you. Oh, my dear Helen, you know something of the Christian faith. You tell and teach. Tell it to your little brother and teach him. Enough, enough, cried the cruel dragoon, taking hold of his carabine, and she turned her eyes to heaven and commended her soul into the hands of her Redeemer. The soldier who accompanied Rathburn, softened by the tears of the mother and the shrieks of the daughter, urged him to let her go. But Rathburn, steady in his unmerciless mercifulness, leveled his gun, and as Mrs. Thompson's eyes were turned from heaven on her dear child, he fired one shot. It took effect on her left side, touched the heart. Her head fell back. She threw a dim look on her daughter, seemed to breathe the blessing she could not pronounce, drew her arms convulsively over her breast, and again they fell back on the heath, and her soul ascended on high. The old farmer, shepherd, having heard the mortal shot, came up to the place where the body of Mrs. Thompson lay, Little Helen recovered from her experience a little, clung to her mother, and with her arms clasped about her neck, the shepherd said, Your mother is gone. Gone to meet your father where Christ dwells. She is happy, and she wishes you to be comforted. And you will see her when you go to heaven. It may be supposed that she could not remember the whole of her mother's dying advice. But her ear had caught these words, and they were imprinted on her memory forever. Never, never forsake God, and he'll never forsake you. Teach your little brother, and I look forward to seeing you at last in heaven. These are the last words of this little chapter. It says, And shall the Christian take up the books of those who deliberately laugh? at their memories, and laugh along with them? Shall the Christian hear the sufferings jeered at, 
their motives misconstrued and their doings misrepresented, and give a smile of half-approval? Were our persecuted ancestors robbed of their goods, hunted like wild beasts on the mountains, imprisoned, tortured, banished, murdered? Did they eat the bread of affliction and drink the water of affliction, and watch at cold midnight in caves and dens? And shall we not remember them? Helen and William, holding one another by the hand, stood by the grave of their mother and wept. This shall be my church, said Helen. Here I will read my Bible. Here I will pray. Here I will teach you, William, and give you our mother's last advice. <laughs>